Well, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Costas Panos, and I'm uh, honored today to uh, present uh, the C3.AI Digital Transformation Institute Colloquium for today. Uh, <clears throat> for those of you who are new to this uh, forum, uh, I would like to let you know that uh, uh, we have a mission in C3.DTI to attract the world's leading scientists to join in a coordinated and innovative effort to advance the digital transformation of business, government, and society. We are a relatively new institute. It started a little bit uh, less than a year ago. And uh, we consist of a group of universities uh, funded by C3.AI, helped by Microsoft, but uh, our group involves Illinois, Berkeley, CMU, KTH, Berkeley, the Berkeley Lab is with us, MIT, NCSA, Princeton University, Stanford University, and the University of Chicago. We have a very exciting series of events, and you can see it here starting from next week, uh, Professor Zico Coulter from uh, CMU uh, talking about building structures in the deep learning. This uh, seminar happens every Thursday at one o'clock. And as you can see in the subsequent listings here, we have really an exciting sequence of events. Uh, if you miss one of our events, or if you want to see the, some of the events in the past, you can view them on YouTube. They are all of them being recorded, including this one, and you can view them here in the link on the screen. <clears throat> we also have uh, uh, workshops, and the next one is happening on March 24 to 26, a, two -day, a three day workshop data-driven decision-making in socio-technical systems. You are all welcome to, to register and attend this one. And of course, uh, the main thing that we do is uh, we issue calls for proposals. Our first call for proposal was on COVID-related uh, AI technologies that happened last May. And uh, the second call for proposals is open right now, is about the digital transformation and AI for energy and climate security. As you can see in the listing of topics, by the way, this is not an exhaustive list. You can add your own. You can get an idea about what we're about. We're about using modern AI, machine learning, big data analytics, and relevant tools in order to address the problems related to energy and climate security. Both of them, of course, very important topics. <clears throat> now, the call for proposals is open. Uh, I believe the deadline for the proposals is on, the, on at the end of the month, at the end of the month, March 29th at uh, midnight Pacific Daylight Time, and uh, we have uh, weekly office hours in order to get yourself acquainted about the details of this call and also get acquainted about the uh, uh, technical support and development operations that would be available to you, and you can use not only to develop this proposal but also to pursue the project uh, if you get funded. So getting closer to today's event, uh, the colloquia have a pretty straightforward format, 40 minute presentation, 15 minute Q&A. Uh, you can use the Q&A feature on this, uh, on this webinar in, in order to ask questions. Uh, if you see a question that you have, have liked to ask, you can upvote it. So you can uh, raise it in priority. And of course, we'll try to, to, to answer as many questions as the time will allow. And with that, I would like to present today's uh, title, which is Using Data Science to Understand the Heterogeneity of SARS-CoV-2 Transmission and COVID-19 Clinical Presentation in Mexico. We have two presenters today, and I'm very glad to make a brief introduction of both of them. The first is uh, Professor Stefano Bertozzi. He's the Dean Emeritus and Professor of Health Policy and Management at the UC Berkeley School of Public Health. He stepped down as the interim director of Alianza, UCMX, which integrates all UC system-wide programs with Mexico. Previously, he directed the HIV, HIV TB program at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. At the Mexican National Institute of Public Health, he served as director of its Center for, for Evaluation, Research, and Surveys. He was the last director of the WHO Global Program on AIDS and has also held positions with uh, UNAIDS, the World Bank, and the government of the Democratic Republic of Congo. 
He now serves as the founding director, as founding editor in chief for For Abit Review COVID 19. It is a new overlay journal that reviews COVID 19 research published by MIT Press. He has a bachelor's degree in biology and a PhD in health policy and management from MIT. And he had his medical degree at UCSD and trained in internal medicine at UCSF. <clears throat> uh, professor Jean Pablo Guterres uh, is a professor at the Center of Policy, Population and Health Research, National Autonomous University of Mexico, UNA. Chair of the Technical Committee of the Morales Commission of Evaluation of Social Development and member of Gavi Evaluation Advisory Committee. He focuses his research on comprehensive evaluation of social programs and policies, universal health coverage and effective access, and social inequalities in health. He has been responsible for the evaluation of social and health programs in Mexico, Ecuador, Guatemala, Dominican Republic, Honduras, and India, as well as several population-based health surveys, both in households and facilities. He's a member of the National Observatory on Health Inequalities in Mexico and has authored or co-authored more than 60 papers in peer-reviewed journal, journals. And with that, I welcome uh, our two presenters and I'm looking forward for the presentation. Costas, thank you very much for that uh, generous introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for the invitation to speak. We, um, we're at the very beginning of the work on our C3 AI projects because we have been working with two systems that in an unprecedented way shared their data with universities. And what we've got today, we actually took the in Mexico out of the title because we have some preliminary data of our work in Mexico. And we have also some preliminary data of work with the California state prison system two systems that um, uh, don't have a history of, of very transparent data sharing with outside academic institutions. And so we're really excited by the access that we now have to the data and excited also about uh, the ability to work collaboratively on this platform to be able to work uh, across national borders in a secure way with sensitive data. So I'm gonna start and then pass it over to Juan Pablo and uh, we'll pass it back and forth a little bit. Um, I'd encourage everybody to please um, interrupt us, ask questions, ask cl clarifying questions anytime, uh, post questions on the Q&A. We'll try to do what we can to answer questions as we go. Um, and if we um, end up running out of time because we're in discussions, that's a welcome uh, because we're at the very beginning of the work. And uh, one of the things that I've seen happen in these seminars in the past has been the development of new collaborations because of people who are participating in the webinar and who are also interested in the work. So let me start with a little bit of background. Um, in terms of Mexico- Could you share your, your, your slides aren't appearing? Oh, thank you very much. Sorry about that. There, now the slides should be appearing, I hope. And Yes, so thank you. to start with, just uh, only maybe we should uh, also acknowledge the collaboration with the people at teams at the. Ab absolutely, um, and thank you, Juan Pablo. This um, this first part of the talk on the collaboration with Mexico is a tripartite um, collaboration between UC Berkeley, the National University in Mexico, and our colleagues at the Mexican. Uh, National Social Security Institute, which um, is the large, well, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about it, but the research division there is, an, is a third equal partner in this, uh, in this collaboration. So in terms of a little bit of context, COVID-19 is really the perfect storm in Mexico. And you, those of you who are in the US might think that the only perfect storm is the US um, under the, at least under the previous administration. But uh, COVID unfortunately in Mexico comes in with even worse levels of inequality than the US has and an epidemic of NCD, of non-communicable diseases. The number one cause of morbidity and mortality in Mexico is diabetes, and it's also the most important risk factor for severe disease. So this synergy between poverty, non-communicable diseases, and COVID is that perfect storm in Mexico. Now, if you look at other 
<clears throat> at OECD countries ranked by Gini coefficient, measuring the level of inequality in the country, you can see that uh, the US is the worst of the high income countries, but Mexico is even worse than the US. And here you can see in diabetes, this is from the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, um, Burden of Disease website, and uh, the lighter the color, the worse the diabetes. And so you can see that all of Mexico is worse than everything. The best of Mexico is as bad as West Virginia, which is the worst of the US. And Mexico City here in the middle, the whitest one, uh, is worse than the rest of Mexico. So diabetes is a huge problem in the country. Here you can see the trajectory of the epidemic in Mexico. And this is the daily confirmed COVID deaths per million people. So this is population adjusted data. And you can see that the Mexican and US epidemics um, were largely tracking each other. Brazil has just exceeded both. But it's also important to note that the level of underreporting of COVID deaths is likely to be significantly greater in Mexico than it is in the US. And um, so let me <clears throat> show you one reason for that. And this is the daily COVID tests per thousand people. So while the US, we've complained about the fact that there wasn't nearly enough testing in the US for many months of the epidemic, you can see here that it absolutely dwarfs Mexico, which has one of the lowest testing rates in the world, uh, despite of course having a very serious epidemic. And you can see that for much of the, the, the fall, the percent of COVID tests in Mexico that were positive was in the 50% range. It's now down to about 27%. And in the US where we complain a lot about it, it's still high compared to other OECD countries, but it's about 6%. So huge differences. Now, what this immediately translates into is that the number of cases is dramatically underreported because of course, most people who are positive are not getting tested in Mexico. Even in the US, um, we have many uh, cases that are, that are not being diagnosed. But in Mexico, that's much more the case. But even that even translates into deaths. So you have deaths that might be COVID, but they were never actually tested. And so therefore, um, they, they can be classified based on clinical suspicion. But of course, that misses many more. And here you can see what that translates into. Uh, and this has to do with the number of cases that are identified. And that's the case fatality rate. So when the case fatality rate is the ratio between confirmed deaths and confirmed cases, it looks incredibly high for Mexico. Mm -hmm. And that's in part probably because of higher mortality, but it's much more due to the fact that the under, the under confirmation of cases. And you can see the US down there at 1.8. And I have on this slide, just as a teaser for the, <clears throat> excuse me, the second topic, that within the California state prison system, the case fatality rate is 0.4%, so much lower than the US reports overall. Of course, that may be because the prison system has lower mortality, and it, to some degree that's true, but it's also the fact that we test everybody in the prison system. With 90,000 uh, inmates in the, in the prison system, we have over 800,000 tests. And you can see here above that, the CMF is essentially the skilled nursing facility for the prison system in California. And even there, the mortality rate is below that of the US. So what is the EMS? The EMS is the largest health provider in Mexico. And it's organized for those that know the US system like the VA, the VA system. All the providers are employees, the hospitals and clinics are fully owned and operated by the EMS. And it's 100% public but it, op it operates in a semi-autonomous way from the Ministry of Health, just like the VA is its own autonomously operated entity. You can see here that the affiliated population is almost 75 million, the largest such provider in the country. And what we have uh, with this collaboration is unprecedented sharing of EMS databases with university research partners. So these databases include data on over 300 million outpatient visits, over 5 million hospitalizations, and almost half a billion prescriptions. And what we have is the two years of data prior to COVID, plus the data since the start of the pandemic. 
So the primary research questions that we want to address are how well do the demographic, occupational, and health, including factors such as comorbid conditions, healthcare utilization, medications, procedures, supply constraints, and anything that we have about the healthcare system, as well as uh, community and health system variables, how well do all those things predict infection with COVID-19? Now, the AIMS social security system is much more than healthcare for Mexicans. It is for private sector employees, the health system, it's also the pension system, it's also the workman's comp system, it's also daycare. Um, so in theory, there are many other databases within the system that could provide even more information about the, the predictors of infection. But initially we'll be looking at the health related variables. And then secondly, how well do all of those variables plus variables describing the specific treatment of that individual's infection predict the severity of infection, including death. And so, you know, access to the clinical treatment data um, for that particular individual can provide us just a huge number of people um, to help better understand the severity. And, you know, the kinds of things that you can think about is not just comorbid conditions, but being able to have much greater granularity, such as which drugs were being used for those comorbid conditions, et cetera. Um, the, um, it, in terms of the data sharing, uh, just because I, I see the question, um, I don't know about standard, um, uh, standard enc standards for encoding, but what we're doing here is sharing de-identified data which is identified with dummy identifiers so that we're able to link health records and uh, COVID results, et cetera, but not able to identify uh, patients. At the same time, we're also maintaining uh, HIPAA levels of, of data security so that somebody uh, wouldn't be in a position to sort of back out um, any, any individual identifiers from the data. So areas of interest, um, we're interested in predicting not just uh, infection and severity, but also impact, socioeconomic impact and vulnerability to that socioeconomic impact for the beneficiaries. That means the, the people who, who are covered by this health system, but also for their employers and, uh, and potentially even their communities. Uh, we're interested in the health effects of the shutdown. Uh, what has that done in terms of changing access to care for non-COVID related conditions? and what has happened uh, as a result of changes in community characteristics. So one example is a colleague of mine is interested in what has happened in Mexico City as the traffic shut down because of the shutdown, urban pollution shut, uh, was reduced. What is that doing to um, preterm birth, um, just as an example. So in terms of predictors of clinical effectiveness, uh, the ability to look at the characteristics of the hospital or clinic, including things such as volume, experience of the providers, education, the availability of specialists, um, workload, supply chain, availability of specific drugs. And then of course, um, there's the possibility of looking at clinical decision-making and thinking about using AI to help inform clinical decision-making. So we welcome uh, both the participants here and the opportunities for future collaboration around interesting questions that could be addressed. In terms of preliminary results, um, this is drawn from the public data and I'm gonna uh, pass the microphone off to, to Juan Pablo to take us through some of the work that he's done with the publicly available data and with some of the preliminary IMSS data that we have. So, Thank you, Steph. Uh, can you just go back for a second to the presentation? Sure. Thank you. Uh, so uh, as Steph mentioned, uh, what I want to do now is to review some of these uh, results that we go analyzing the public data for COVID cases in Mexico. Uh, there is a daily updated open access data set with all suspicious cases in, in, in the country that includes, uh, includes uh, test results, of course, for those that were tested, symptoms and underlying conditions, as well as uh, patient status, including, including deaths. And, and after that, I'm, I'm going to review uh, the data on COVID-19 that we got from, from IMSS that is also uh, uh, periodically updated. Uh, I think that the key difference, and that's important to mention here, the, between the IMSS data that uh, 
we are we are getting from them and and, and this public data is the this possibility of linking the, the all cases suspicious cases and confirmed cases with the previous interactions uh, their previous interaction with the health services so we, we are able to know about previous hospitalizations all patients vis visits and, and prescriptions uh, and, and the idea to mention some of these uh, results from the public data is uh, to highlight some of the key areas i mean from what Steph already mentioned that we are going to in, intend to explore further with the more detail uh, in this data and you go to the next place so uh, one initial issue, and, and Steph mentioned that when uh, he was mentioned this perfect storm, it's the, the this coexistence of um, non-communicable diseases epidemic in Mexico. Of course, it's also the case in, in most of the uh, countries in, in the region, in, in the Americas, including the US. And uh, this is what uh, has been called a uh, syndemic. So that is uh, two or more uh, synergistic epidemics that are also occurring in a context of social inequality. We know that uh, individuals with uh, presenting COVID and, and NCD and non-communicable disease at the same time have a worse prognosis. And from this public data, we were able to uh, discern both the, the high level of NCDs among this uh, population, in particular diabetes, diabetes and uh, how this is also related to poverty at the municipality level. Uh, it's important to highlight that the uh, general population prevalence of diabetes in Mexico is about 15%. So as you can see, uh, most of these uh, uh, individuals, I mean, this group of mun municipalities has a, a, a larger prevalence than the, the general population. Um, can we go to the next please? So using uh, this uh, data that is uh, updated and in, for this analysis up to November last year, and uh, with a mixed effects uh, model with random effects at the municipality level, uh, we estimated the, the odds of dying uh, by COVID-19 depending on the poverty level. So the, the poverty level, again, at the municipality, at the municipality level, and as you can see, uh, in Mexico, the probability of dying for COVID-19 is higher for those individuals that are uh, living in, in municipalities with a larger proportion of the population living in, in poverty. And that's kind of a stepwise uh, uh, fashion. This relation even increased when controlling for underlying conditions, suggesting a heavier burden of uh, non-communicable disease among those in poverty. Uh, here, the message is that uh, probability of death is a function of wealth, so it's, it's a totally unfair outcome. Uh, I mean, we, we should take into account that the poverty level is at the municipality level, so it's a, we, we, I mean, there is a potential ecology fallacy here, but nevertheless, uh, the higher pro the, the proportion in the locality is higher the probability the individuals are poor. So, I mean, for the last group of municipalities, that's about 80% um, uh, of, of more of the population living in poverty. Can, ah, can you do an, one click, please? One more? So this is just comparing the, the percentage of the of the total population in the country in the red numbers that are living in these categories of municipalities compared to what we got from, from, the, from the data. So the probability of being positive is higher for those uh, with lower proportion, I mean, in those municipalities with lower proportion in individuals living in poverty. But this is, uh, we can think that this is a reflection mostly of the pandemic path, I mean, in, in, in uh, uh, the, the, the pandemic affected uh, firstly the larger municipalities and then it's moving to the, to the smaller uh, municipalities. Uh, next one, please. In the same direction, so the probability of dying is higher among those that report speaking an in, in indigenous language. This uh, could be further refined if the data includes self-reporting on being of indigenous origin, but as currently data is just uh, have the variable on whether or not they speak an indigenous uh, language. Next one, please. So um, this is the data that we got from IMSS on individuals with the suspicion of COVID-19. And this is covering until 
early February this year. That includes about, as you can see, uh, 2.70 million records. And uh, of those, uh, we have data on COVID-19 status for uh, about uh, 60, 66%. Uh, I mean, in the sense that uh, uh, they, they got that, uh, a PCR test or a rapid test. Uh, as we are going to mention uh, with an, some additional details in a minute, the positivity rate, so that's the, the percentage of these uh, individuals that have a, a positive result on, on, the, on the COVID-19, um, is about uh, 52%. About 30% uh, of COVID-19 positive individuals has been hospitalized and 60% has died. In terms of the underlying condition, conditions, again, uh, diabetes seems to be the one that is uh, uh, particularly higher among uh, these patients compared to the general population. And in, in any case, the prevalence of all non-communicable disease, I mean, here, diabetes, obesity, and uh, hypertension, uh, it's, it's uh, higher among uh, individuals that tested positive compared to those that tested negative. Um, um, between, uh, as that's the last line, uh, between uh, 2017 and 2019, about 5% uh, of uh, COVID-19 positive individuals were hospitalized, but of course for, for other, other conditions. And there is a higher percentage on, on those that tested negative that were uh, ha also hospitalized, that's uh, 6%. Uh, we don't have a clear explanation on, on, on this at, at this point, but that's something that we will uh, explore further to understand uh, this difference. Next one, please. Yeah. Juan Pablo, one of the things that when we talked about this yesterday, I was thinking that people with serious pre-existing conditions might have a lower threshold for testing and therefore you know, something that was less likely to be COVID, they might be more likely to be tested. Maybe that helps to explain why, why right. we're seeing this, but um, we, right. we, it is something interesting to explore further because it's certainly not what either of us expected. Exactly, yeah, no, that's a good point. So on hospitalization, so overall the probability of hospitalization was uh, higher among those that tested positive. So that's to say that uh, uh, those that tested negative has another condition that in some cases also requires hospitalization, but you can see there the difference, 30% versus 16%. Um, I mean, of course, uh, we know that hospitalization is a variable that is under control of health providers. But in, in particular, in the case of Mexico, what we know is that the, the recommendation uh, was to, to hospitalize hospitalize only severe cases. So uh, in this case, in, uh, at least for Mexico, we can use hospitalization as a proxy for, for severity. Uh, the median and average states are not uh, that uh, extent. I mean, that's uh, uh, 6.1 days uh, in the, the, the average and uh, the median of four days. So it's not th that much. And, and, and uh, um, I mean, we, we need to control for, for higher mortality that will be also uh, uh, related to this decision of hospitalized only severe case. As you can see in, in the graph, uh, the older individuals, so those with higher mortality, tend to present shorter stays at the hospital. And I think that's consistent with the argument that uh, people arrive to the hospital uh, uh, in general, we were, we were, they were presenting a severe case. So uh, the, the shorter the state for older uh, individuals is, uh, could be related to the fact that they uh, die very quickly when, when they were uh, uh, arrived at the, at the hospital. Uh, Juan Pablo, it, it might also be worth mentioning that with such a low testing rate in the country, national policy was prioritizing testing in certain sentinel um, surveillance sites for anybody with any respiratory symptoms but the majority of the testing for people with significant symptoms. So for those of you who are shocked by a 30% hospitalization rate, that really is a reflection of who's being tested, um, not of severity in the population. I mean, severity in, in, the, in the people that were tested. No? Right, That's exactly. It. Severity in the people who were tested and testing preferentially for people with significant symptoms. Exactly, yeah, thank you. Next one. 
So um, here we are presenting the positivity rate. So that's the percentage of uh, uh, positive cases between all tested and the uh, case fat fatality rate uh, by month from uh, February to December uh, 2020. The size of these circles are reflecting the number if, of individuals with uh, uh, COVID-19 status uh, by that month. And uh, we included those with uh, rapid, rapid tests and those uh, that, that uh, because of the, the uh, individual that, that died and, and were related to, to, to an, an another uh, COVID-19 case. So they were assigned to as a, as a COVID positive individuals. Um, um, so um, I guess for this, um, well, just to mention that, uh, as you can see here, uh, for for 2020, the the case fatality rate was about above 15 percent in all months, and, and and it's not shown here, but it's also higher for males compared to 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 females in terms of the of the graph, and um, well, also the positivity rate 53 percent. It's uh, also higher for, for males compared to, to females. And uh, this is uh, the same variables, but here the graph is by delegation. Uh, the, uh, delegations are the administrative units of, of INS are uh, close to, to, to states in the country. And, and only those, I mean, Mexico has 32 states and there is further division for the larger states. So at the end we have 37 uh, uh, delegations. So um, again, this is uh, uh, the size of the of the circle is reflecting the the number of suspicion cases in, in, in each delegation. And as you can see, there is a, a relevant, I will say, relevant heterogeneity uh, in, in the country in terms of the positivity and the case fatality rate. So uh, uh, there is a, a different. I mean, very huge variation on, 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 on these indicators in the different uh, in the different delegations and in, as we can see in the next one that's uh, even more more uh, clear when we talk about the facilities so this is the, the same analysis but here we are uh, using as a unit of analysis the facility uh, the facility where the people were uh, ascribed so as, as you can see here, there are some uh, uh, small facilities, uh, I guess, uh, small number in, in terms of, of cases that are either 0% or 100% in terms, in terms of the, the fatality ratio. But uh, leaving that out, I mean, we can see here that there is a, a kind of a, a clear direction in terms of the larger facilities tend to perform better. And, and that's uh, facilities that are in the in the Mexico City and other other uh, metropolitan areas. But I think the most interesting part is to the medium sized facilities where you can see this uh, huge variation in terms of both the positivity and, and the case fatality, fatality ratio. So uh, even at the same uh, uh, size of, of the facilities, you can go test, for example, of the fatality, fatality ratio from close to zero to almost about uh, 60 percent. So, I mean, uh, uh, this heterogeneity is reflecting, we believe, a uh, difference in, in, in quality of, of, of care. And that's part of what we want uh, to, to explore using the uh, specific uh, variables from, from each facility in terms of the, of the structural factors that could be affecting the, the quality of, of services. Next one, please. And uh, finally, it's the same uh, indicators, but in this case, uh, we order by age of, of uh, the individuals. And, and, and I mean, here is, uh, you can see how um, positivity, it uh, seems to be uh, well correlated with age. So this is an increasing with, with, with age. And, but uh, the fatality, fatality rate is slow uh, seems to be low up to 15 years and, and then in 50 years and then increase dramatically above 50% for older individuals. And uh, in, the, in the, the right 
side, you can see the same graph, but uh, uh, differentiating by uh, females and males. I mean, it's the same pattern, but just uh, higher levels for, for males compared to, to females. And I think that's the last one, yeah. So um, we're tracking the questions. So feel free to slow us down and, um, and post questions. But in absence of any, I'll say a few words about some of the prison health work in California. And uh, this is a collaboration with the AMEND project at uh, UCSF. Uh, we work together on something called CalProtect, which works with the state uh, prison system. It's important to know that the health system within the California state prison system has been under receivership, uh, of, uh, under federal receivership for over a decade because it was judged to be unconstitutionally, excuse me, poor care um, for the inmates. And so the federal receiver oversees the health system in the prisons. Um, you probably uh, are well aware from the newspaper that prisons and jails in the US have seen just some of the worst um, uh, clusters of, of COVID. Um, eight of the top 10 clusters in the country are jails and prisons in California. Seven of those eight are prisons and one is the Fresno County Jail. But you can see here the kinds of numbers um, that we've, what we've seen in the prisons in the country. Um, in May of, of uh, last year, on the last day of, of May, um, 120 men were moved from Southern California to San Quentin. And they were moved there because they were either elderly or had comorbid conditions and they were living in dorms in a Southern California prison. And the idea was to move them to a prison where they could be housed in cells and therefore at lower risk of infection. And so they were moved to San Quentin. Unfortunately, in retrospect, without adequate testing, or even infection control uh, measures during their transit. The, um, we visited on the 13th, on the, uh, yeah, on June 13th, at which time they reported to us 14 cases. It turns out there were actually 16 cases that had already been diagnosed among the 120 men who'd moved in. And uh, we visited one day and issued some urgent recommendations. Now, this is an example of the cell block. It's not the exact cell block, but it looks exactly the same badger block, which housed these men. So this cell block was, San Quentin opened in the, in the mid 1800s, but this cell block was built in the 1920s. And you can see here that it's five tiers, three, four, five tiers, one on top of the other. And this, you're only looking at half of a half. So this is a long cell block. It's mirrored on the other side. So imagine it, it's the equivalent of a Hyatt hotel, but instead of having the atrium in the middle and the rooms on the outside, in this case, the rooms are in the middle and the atrium is around the outside. So there's lots of, relatively speaking, lots of natural light here. You can see these very large windows. Unfortunately, a number of years ago, they were all welded shut. Um, so there is no circulation of air through those windows. And the men that were moved into these cells were moved into cells with the idea that individual cells would be safer. But what you can see here is that these are not in fact separate rooms because the entire wall and door is just open bars. So what happened was these men were moved from dorms that varied from 20 to even 200 people in Southern California into what is functionally a dorm of 750 men. And when we walked in a few days after they had been moved in and the first cases had been identified and everyone was locked down, so it didn't look like this, everyone was in their cells, and they were trying to speak to us, we were standing down here, and they're screaming at us from many tiers up about what a terrible situation they've been put in because 120 men up on top and the top tier and the bottom, hundreds of men who were up until that point uninfected. And they were not happy about it, as you can imagine. And of course, I'm sitting there thinking, screaming is a great way to aerosolize. And so what we've got is a situation where people are aerosolizing like crazy in a dorm of, 100, of 750 men. We issued um, urgent recommendations, and you can see here this graph, the bottom is California, the orange line is the system as a whole, and then in early June, the introduction into San Quentin, uh, which ended up with uh, over 2,200 2, cases, over 400 staff and 28 deaths. 
Now, that's a relatively high mortality rate in terms of what we've seen throughout the system, partly because it was early in the, in the uh, um, epidemic and we didn't know as much as we do now about how to treat people effectively. But also it's important to know that even though San Quentin is a prison from the 1850s, it's also called the Yale of the California State Prison System because it has the best programming by far. It has university programs, music programs, art programs. It's where people spend decades in the system trying to get to. So that means it has a much higher proportion of older and uh, uh, of older inmates and inmates with other medical conditions. So at higher risk. A couple of weeks ago, um, I went to a different prison. And I wanna show you this because somebody said to me early on in the work that I've been doing in prisons, that Steph, when you've seen one prison, you've seen one prison. So the idea the sort of external validity of what you learn at San Quentin doesn't have much applicability in this case at the California Substance Abuse Treatment Facility, which even despite its name is actually just a, a prison. It's a very large prison, over 4,000 men. And you can see here from the satellite view that it's organized into these, in, in, in what are in essence, um, mini prisons within a prison. So these, these cell blocks, I mean, sorry, these yards here, in fact, share nothing. These inmates in A and B have zero contact with each other. And the security apparatus is separate for A and B from C, from D, from E, and from commonly F and G. Even though F and G are separate, they're accessed through common security. Now, I wanna show you what these look like inside. It's completely different. So this is yard A, which is the same as B. And down below, you can see a schematic of what a building, one of these buildings look like. These were built in the mid 1990s, okay? So the previous one was the, um, uh, was the 1920s. And here you can see it's a dorm environment. There were 48 men in a facility just like this when I visited. These mini sleeping areas within the dorm were designed to house 12 inmates each. Because of COVID, they were reduced to eight, but there are 48 men here. And as you can see down here in the diagram, if the camera was pointing to the right, you would see that there's a large opening, which is just covered with a grate into the next 48 men, into the next 48 men. So it's really closer to 150 that are sharing the same airspace. And as just as I said in San Quentin, this isn't 750 men, but this is an environment for extremely rapid spread of a respiratory pathogen. Yard D um, is completely different. So this is the picture of Yard D when we were there. We took this picture ourselves. And here you can see that it's completely different. Now it's not different in one important respect. And that is that here you can see windows at the back of these sleeping areas. Those are sealed windows. You can see air handlers here on the top, but these are sealed windows. The only openable window is in the guard station that's right behind where the photographer is standing. Here, the same thing is true. Each of these cells has a small window but there are no openable windows with the exception of an openable window in the guard station at the beginning. So there's a door and an openable window, but everything else is handled through the air circulation system. And what you've got here is unlike San Quentin, these are solid walls, solid doors. The bars that you see here are actually on the shower, but this is as safe as it could be. We thought when we left San Quentin, that if you're looking at relative safety, this is where you'd want to be if you, were, uh, if you had a respiratory um, uh, epidemic compared to a place like San Quentin or like the dorms that I just showed you. What we did on our visit to this facility was we measured CO2 and we can use CO2 to look at air exchanges per hour because of course people emit CO2 and that's diluted with outside air. You can look at the differential CO2 concentrations and calculate air changes per hour. And you can see here that unfortunately in the dorm environment, the air changes per hour were less than one, while in these individual cells measured in the cells, the air exchanges per hour were closer to six. Now, WHO and, and US standards suggest that if you have an environment with infected individuals with a respiratory pathogen, you should be at 12 or better. So you can imagine that yard A or, or places like yard A is not the place you'd want to be uh, to share airspace with somebody who's got a respiratory pathogen. So you would expect that here, you would have much more rapid spread in A than D. And that's of course exactly what we predicted. Um, however, we were really surprised because here's the initial outbreak. 
in this prison and it was in yard B, which is the same as A, it's exactly what you're looking at here. But then in late October, there was an explosive epidemic in D, the one that you're looking at down below here. And how could this be? Well, we have two potential explanations. One is that the viruses that are circulating in early summer and in the fall were different. And there's evidence to suggest that California strains in the fall were more transmissible than the ones that were circulating earlier in the year. However, I mean, I would be very surprised to think that that marginal difference in transmissibility would lead to such dramatically different behavior um, across housing units. But the other thing that happened was that it got cold and the heat was turned on. Now, it turns out that these buildings, when it's hot, are cooled with swamp coolers, as in evaporative coolers. Evaporative coolers take advantage of low humidity outside. They pass the air over evaporative um, membranes and that cooler air is fed into the facility. For evaporative coolers to work, you've got to then exhaust that air and bring in new air that is being uh, subject to evaporation. So you have 100% air exchange with a cooling system. Once you switch to a heating system, that switches to recirculation so that you're not unnecessarily heating outside air. And when it was switched over, it was 90% recirculated. And that recirculation does happen through filters, but unfortunately not MERV 13 or better filters that are the level that recommended by the CDC to actually um, sufficiently reduce viral counts. So what we suspect happened was when the um, uh, recirculation system was turned on with the heating, that what we were doing was taking infected particles, aerosols, and spreading them throughout the facility, which led to the kind of explosive spread that you saw in the um, epidemic curve. The other thing you can see here at the level of the entire system, this is prepared by the system, you can see that early in the epidemic, this is May back here, that most of the spread was happening in either dorms or in, this is San Quentin here in yellow, in barred cells, which are functionally dorms uh, from an, an air sharing perspective. This uh, other yellow over here is Folsom Prison, which dates to, uh, was constructed at approximately the same time as San Quentin was. And then here you can see that later, the explosive growth in these single-celled solid doors, solid walls. So I'm going to stop there because I want to uh, leave us some time for questions. And I can see that there are a couple um, that are available here. So let me stop sharing and just go to the, our last slide here and uh, where you have our emails uh, and leave that up for just a second. Uh, but I can also put that in the chat. Uh, so that people can see it. In fact, it is already in the chat in response to a previous question from Brazil. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Stefano Juan Pablo. Very exciting presentation. Um, there are a couple of op open questions on the chat uh, that you might want to address, uh, either of you. So um, one of the things, the first question is about sequencing efforts. And um, to be honest, as a country, we've just been horrible about this, uh, the proportion of our, um, of the positive samples that have been sequenced. Um, we have had initially difficulty getting sequencing even for what appear to be repeat infections. Um, that's been recently improved. And one of the recommendations that we've made to the system is that all cases that appear to be repeat infections in people who were previously infected and all cases in um, people who have been vaccinated need to be sequenced because the likelihood that we're going to find variants that are, uh, if you will, escape variants, either from the natural immunity induced by the first infection or to the immunity in induced by the vaccine are, are going to be much higher probability that we're going to find those in these breakthrough infections. And so I'm optimistic that we're going to start doing more sequencing. But unfortunately, the system does almost all of its um, work with an outside company which has limited capability to store samples. And so we've had almost no ability to compare the sequences from the initial samples to the potential repeat samples uh, later on. But in, we, we are seeing actually to date a very low number of what appear to be confirmed repeat infections, as opposed to just that small tail of the distribution that continues to shed RNA and continues to be PCR positive. Um, on the second question, um, uh, 
Juan Pablo, why don't you why don't you take that one? Um, and then I can comment as well if you want. So you say no, there's the third one. I mean, the third oh, the one third is... one. I'm sorry, I, I I didn't realize that they they had. Um, yeah, why don't you go ahead and take the third one, then I'll come back to the one that's currently the top one. Right. So I, I will say two, two things. I mean, the, the first is that uh, uh, that uh, take us to, to think on, on a better integrated uh, health services. And, and now as is currently uh, having a different uh, sets for, for uh, uh, transmiss transmissible conditions and non-communicable uh, conditions, we need to have a very integrated system for primary healthcare, I will say. And in addition to that, I guess the other implication is that we need to, to highlight the importance to, of addressing the social determinants of health. I mean, uh, uh, what we are seeing here on, on this is a huge inequality in, in, in the outcomes from, from COVID, but that's also the case for, for diabetes and other non-communicable diseases. So uh, uh, to prioritize reducing inequalities as a, as a, as a main goal of health systems. Thank you. Oh. And I see that, uh, Stefano, you you answered uh, the other question uh, in writing. Uh, about... Yes. Um, and I put the link in there. This is why I wanted to do it typing. Um, the link is to the CDCR website, which is the most transparent um, prison health system in the country. Um, I, I wouldn't be surprised if it's the most transparent in the world. Uh, not only do you have this COVID site, which uh, actually I can very quickly share my screen, um, but you can see here prison by prison within the system. You can look at um, active, released, resolved deaths. We've had over 49,000 cases and you can drill in to institution views um, so that you can see individual prisons. So for example, if we wanna look at uh, San Quentin, um, oh, California State Prison, San Quentin. Um, you can see here the explosive epidemic um, in, in June, July, and then currently zero cases. Um, but uh, you have uh, access to lots of data here on this site. Um, but unfortunately, with respect to modeling within the prison, uh, there's no publicly available data set that it goes below the level of aggregation at the at the institution level, um, but there's certainly the opportunity for collaborating, and I'd encourage you to um, send me an email. Great. Uh, I have a question myself since I have the privilege of having the mic. Uh, the, it's, it's mostly a statistical question, but maybe there's some other issues behind it. You have the issue of underreporting. You have the issue of, uh, of uh, bias testing or an availability of testing. And you very much like to control for those in order to draw conclusions about, uh, oh, you have the issue of comorbidities and so on. How do you control for those in order to draw reliable conclusions about, uh, let's say, uh, uh, mortality rates and other key issues or correlation to poverty, right? How do you control for those under reporting and uh, bias testing? So I, I want Juan Pablo to answer that, but I just want to mention that that's the beauty of the prison data set is that unlike all the community ones, I see. we essentially solve that problem by having universal testing. Um, and uh, which is why I had that teaser at the beginning um, that we have such low uh, mortality rates. Now I was asked two days ago when we gave a, a talk, is that real? Isn't it just that um, you've got lots of young healthy men? And my answer to that question was, well, yes, but even in the nursing home, we have incredibly low mortality. Um, and that has to do uh, partly with the fact that we're, we know where all the cases are, but it's also partly due to the fact that because people are incarcerated, um, we were able to intervene early with effective treatment, in this case, monoclonal antibodies, which unfortunately as a country, we have not managed to roll out, for example, to nursing homes. So over to you, Juan Pablo, on the real question that Costas is answering, is asking. It's a, it's a hard question, but I, I, I will say at this point that uh, that's, I mean, in the Steph's terms, that's the beauty of the data that we have. I mean, we can analyze not only these individuals that were uh, uh, suspicious of having uh, uh, COVID, but uh, the entire population of the, of the IMSS, uh, I mean, that's uh, about 
50 million individuals that we can uh, relate in terms of the location to the individuals that were suspicious and were tested. And, but not only on that, but also in the previous uh, health characterization. So that could uh, uh, allow us to generate some type of profiles of individuals that are likely to be uh, uh, positive, uh, even if they were you know, tested and, and, and on the, for, for the limitations that, that you mentioned. So I think that, uh, I mean, it's not, not perfect, but I, I will say that we, we can try to produce some of these patterns and try to match individuals on, on uh, those profiles and then uh, get uh, more, more, more uh, refined conclusions on that. Thank you. Uh, one more question, maybe that uh, probably more for social commentary, but about who would appreciate your thoughts. Why did it take us so long to acknowledge that aerosols was a means for transmission? You know, Costas, uh, it's been one of my biggest frustrations, um, including with some of my colleagues across the Bay at another very prestigious university. Um, the, you know, I would have thought that the cruise ship um, settled that question. Mm -hmm. Yes. And yet neither CDC nor WHO acknowledged the importance of aerosols um, early on, and then were resistant to changing their public views about it for a very long time. So, you know, we had people, you know, the, the initial response of the prison system, I could show you some pictures, was to take a dorm of 200 men and cluster them so that the bunks were tightly spaced with eight people and then a six foot corridor to another tightly spaced group of eight people so that you have 200 people who are all separated by six feet and therefore you've complied with um, the CDC's recommendations. Now, those 200 men are sharing an airspace. They're not even wearing masks when they're in their cluster because they're more than six feet away from other people. So they tried to recreate the idea of a household within um, a 200 person dorm. Well, it's just ridiculous. And if you saw what happened on the cruise ship, you would have said it was ridiculous, but that's not the guidance we got from the authorities. And so there were a few of us saying to the prison, you know, I, I, and of course our answer to that was as soon as San Quentin happened, we said, this is definitive proof, right? We moved people into separate cells on the top tier of this, of this building and like this, we infected the entire building. So obviously that wasn't fomites and obviously that wasn't large droplets that were traveling that were you know, within six feet. People were locked in their cells. And so we said, you know, whatever they're telling us from CDC and WHO doesn't matter. We have proof within the system that this is aerosolized spread. And of course we know since then that all of the super spreader events um, are you know, largely aerosolized transmission. And I think what we've learned in addition is that super spreaders are disproportionately contributing to the spread of this, of this virus. And one of the interesting modeling things that our, our colleagues are working on is this issue of how important is it um, to the effective, R, to the R effective, um, the heterogeneity in the propensity to transmit. And, um, and the, you know, I didn't show you here because we were running out of time, but we have some preliminary estimates of R effective within these different uh, dorms. And they look terrible, even assuming homogeneous propensity to transmit. Of course, they get even worse with a heterogeneous propensity to transmit. Thank you. There is one more question, which I believe has been answered. It's asking about sequencing data in the correctional or IMSS data. Uh, data. Yeah, I, that's the question that I answered live. Uh, unless there's a oh, different question. It, right. It's a new one, but oh, I believe it has been answered, yeah. Um, yeah, so no, um, uh, we don't have any sequencing data in the prison and our data set from the EMS doesn't include any sequencing data either, but I suspect that to the extent that any exists, Juan Pablo, we could probably have access to it. Uh, I have no idea how much sequencing has been done in, in, in the EMS. No idea at this point, but yeah, I mean, it will be interesting. Interesting question to look into, yeah. Well, um, we are on time. Yeah. So thank you very much for, for, for a very exciting presentation, Juan Pablo and Stefano, and thank you all for attending. I hope to see you all, we hope to see you all next week. Thank you for yes. having us. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Fantastic, yeah.